Good day, YouTube. Warbles on a lot here. With a reading from 30th of May 2015's New Scientist from the front cover article, Getting Away With It. Guilty pleasures that you can sometimes indulge and the ones you can't. Which commences on page 30. First topic, lying and cheating. Followed by chocolate. Then there's inactivity. Which has quite a nice little graph showing how a person's level of activity will reduce their likelihood of dying from the following causes of death. You've got all causes over here from 100% down to 60%, all cancers from 100% <clears throat> down to 75%, cardiovascular disease from 100% down to 55%, diabetes from your 100% risk down to uh, 45%. So just by being active, you can cut the risks of dying from those causes. And then there's red meat. which comes with the warning, never eat processed meat. Followed by super spuds. Eating dairy with your meat might just help to limit the damage. Then they look at late nights. Followed up by screen time, booze, and sunbathing weighing up the risks, accounting for taste, we have the activity of two hours watching TV, sedentary, cuts minus one micro life, smoking two cigarettes cuts minus one micro life, first unit of alcohol for the day increases your time span by plus one micro life, each subsequent unit of alcohol up to six reduces your micro lives by minus a half, First 20 minutes of physical activity increases your time span by plus one. Each subsequent 40 minutes of activity increases your time span by plus one micro life for a man and plus a half for a woman. Calculating whether your guilty pleasure pays is hard. Statements about health risks and benefits can be tricky to wrap your head around. With activities like motorcycling or skydiving, one way is to think in micro morts. A micromort being a one in a million chance of dying then and there. This unit is useful for pursuits that could kill you on the spot, says statistician David Spiegelhalter of the University of Cambridge. When you do these activities, you are going to be healthy unless you are dead. For lifestyle choices that chip away at good health, eating to excess or smoking, think instead of micro lives. A micro life is a millionth of a life and equates to about half an hour. Spiegel Halter reckons that, for a regular smokers at least, every two cigarettes costs one micro life. Okay? 15 minutes to the cigarette. This enables you to make comparisons across broad range of activities using common units and without having to use very technical units like person years lost per something or hazard ratios, he says. Let's weigh up skydiving as against riding a motorcycle. Seven to ten people die for every million parachute jumps, so that's seven to ten micro morts. On a motorbike, you'd do about ten kilometres before reaching one micro mort. So one skydive is like 80 kilometres on a motorbike. Micro lives are useful because of the psychological barrier we put up when considering the long-term health consequences of our actions. It's all to do with the end of your life, and people, especially young people, tend not to care so much about living an extra year being old and dribbly. The idea of the micro lives is that this is happening to you now. You're aging faster because of your behavior. Good habits can also improve life expectancy. Spiegel Halter has devised a micro life calculator, which we've already looked at, which can help you see whether your good habits outweigh the bad. The image is, of course, coming out of the gym and going to the pub, says Spiegel Halter, which when I used to go to the gym is what I always used to do, but it's not to be encouraged. Then we have drugs social smoking, and flying. 
So let's do drugs. Is it worth the trip? This graph shows in red harm to others. In orange, harm to users. Overall harm score is from 0 to 80 out of a possible 100 based on 16 criteria weighted for their importance. Top of the scale is alcohol, followed by heroin, followed by crack cocaine, followed by methamphetamine, followed by cocaine, followed by tobacco, followed by amphetamine, followed by cannabis, followed by GHB, grievous bodily harm, benzodiazepines, ketamine, methadone, mephedrone, butane, anabolic steroids, CAT, ecstasy, LSD, buprenorphine, and mushrooms is the least harmful on the scale. And the text reads, if mind-altering substances are your thing, you're spoiled for choice. Besides marijuana, cocaine, ecstasy, LSD, and mushrooms, a growing, quote, long tail, unquote, of chemicals toast your oats in every conceivable way. There's a reason why drugs have a reputation for being bad for you. They are. Yet at least 160 million people and possibly twice as many indulge at least once every year. So if you fancy a trip to an altered state, how best to get away with it? The answer depends on what you mean by, quote, getting away with it, unquote. You can't guarantee a safe experience, but an informed choice can give you the best chance of avoiding potential harm. Double trouble. Drug harms fall into two broad categories, those that affect you and those that affect others. The personal ones include death, health problems, bracket, including mental health, close bracket, accidents, addiction, relationship breakdown, and legal trouble. Harms to other people include violence, financial problems, crime and environmental damage both at home and where the drugs are produced. One rule of thumb is that risks become more serious with repeated use. Take addiction, for example. According to the U.S. National Institute on Drug Abuse, it can take, quote, only a few, unquote, uses of a drug to become addicted to it, although the potential for addiction varies between drugs and people. Putting firm numbers on this is difficult, but a study published in 2005 found that among a large cohort of people who tried cocaine for the first time, more than one in 20 were dependent on it two years later. Right? 5% of people who try cocaine will be dependent on it in two years' time, if that's correct. Perhaps the best guide to the harms comes from the UK's Independent Scientific Committee on Drugs, bracket ISCD, close bracket, which analysed 20 drugs on 16 criteria. It found the most harmful illicit drug to be heroin, with an overall rating of 55 out of 100, with crack cocaine on 54, see diagram below. LSD and magic mushrooms are among the least harmful and also carry the lowest risk of dependence. Mixing drugs amplifies the risks. Taking cocaine with amphetamines or ecstasy, for example, raises the risk of acute toxicity over and above the sum of their parts. This also extends to nicotine. And of course, most of these drugs are illegal in many places, as well as the potential for falling foul of the law. Users often can't be sure what they are taking. Some nightclubs offer a testing service to analyse the contents of party pills, but on the whole, the only, quote, guarantee, unquote, is the word of the drug dealer. When it comes to the benefit side of the equation, the picture is even less clear. Nobody has yet done an analysis taking into account the pleasure, fun and adventure that people seek when they take drugs. All told, you might conclude that trying to get away with taking drugs isn't worth the risk. If so, this would also rule out a widely consumed and enjoyable substance that the ISCD rated as the most harmful drug of all, alcohol. As regards social smoking, basically they're saying that passive smoking is 1.3 times as dangerous as no exposure at all, and one cigarette a day is 1.4 times the no exposure limit, or only just slightly worse than passive smoking. Bit of a brief segue into e-cigarettes. Of course, quitting is often easier said than done. Even occasional smoking is addictive. Social smokers might not struggle to get through the day without a cigarette, but they tend to have a strong psychological addiction triggered by certain situations. Even those who smoke fewer than one cigarette a day struggle to give up when they want to, with 65% relapsing within six months of their quit attempt. Electronic cigarettes might be a good trick to deal with their situational craving, West says. Quote, e-cigarettes are certainly less toxic than tobacco ones. We don't yet fully understand the long-term consequences, but in the short term, e-cigarettes are a good option, or at least a less bad option than cigarettes. And then there's flying, with the caption, plain stupid. 
You've insulated your house and turned down the thermostat. You're eating less meat. You cycle to work, but a few, a few times a year you fly. In the UK, the average carbon footprint is around 10 tonnes per year, excluding flying. But a single round trip to New Zealand produces 12 tonnes of CO2. Is flying ever going to be anything other than the greatest of green sins? The short answer is no. There isn't much scope for making planes more efficient, and nor have efforts to develop alternatives to fossil fuel-derived kerosene got very far. The ethanol-powered Embraer EMB202 Ipanema does run entirely on biofuel, but it's a single-seater used for crop dusting. Powering airliners with ethanol is problematic, not least because it freezes at normal cruising altitudes. Flying cattle class can help because the more people crammed on a plane, the lower the person per person emissions. But beyond this, things get complicated. Planes burn fuel fastest during takeoff, so you might think short haul flights are worse, but the longer the flight, the more fuel is carried, and the more fuel is burnt to carry this fuel. Claims that summer flights are better because fewer heat trapping contrails form then are mired in uncertainty. Another suggestion is that flying during the day is better because contrails also reflect sunlight, compensating slightly for the heat they trap. But the difference may be negligible. As for taking less luggage, a jet can weigh 400,000 kilograms, 400 tonnes, on takeoff, only a tiny weeny fraction of which is luggage. So, what about offsetting your emissions? The idea that you pay a little extra to support projects such as installing solar panels or planting trees. But the quality of offset projects varies, says Anya Kolmus, an independent environmental consultant based in Zurich, Switzerland. Most companies selling offsets claim their projects are verified. But this is no guarantee of quality, Kolmus says nor that the projects in question wouldn't have happened even without your contribution. When it comes to planting trees, say, what matters is that the trees survive for decades to come. If they die or are cut down, the CO2 they locked away just ends up back in the atmosphere. There are good offset projects out there, says Colmus, but it is very difficult for consumers to identify them. Another option, she suggests, is that every time you fly, you donate money to an organisation campaigning for action to prevent climate change. Supporters of offsetting argue that it is at least better than doing nothing, but not even this is clear. Opponents claim people who buy offsets may feel less guilty and fly even more as a result. The bottom line is that if you can avoid flying, do avoid flying. Now the other thing is all that measurement of atmospheric carbon was just that, atmospheric carbon. 10 tonnes per year sounds pretty good until you consider that it emerges as carbon dioxide and the actual weight of the carbon dioxide of 10 tonnes of carbon coming out your exhaust is closer to 25 tonnes. Yeah? A litre of fuel, two and a half kilograms. So just do the math on that one. You'll find that 10 tonnes of carbon from the Europeans is not that different from... 30 tonnes of carbon dioxide per person per year from the Australians here in Abitania. But anyway, there you go. There's a comparison between the environmental damage of flying, the risk to yourself and others of using drugs, versus social smoking, boozing, vegetating out on the computer screen, pigging out on dead animals, filling up or chocolate, or just telling lots of bullshit. Warbles on a lot to YouTube. There you go. Been meaning to do this for a while. Ciao.